Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Good evening. You are all welcome tonight to this uh, Saturday Zoom meeting. It's a great pleasure for us to be here together. And we want to thank God for his love for us. What a great privilege to be chosen by God. We are chosen by God. We thank God for that choice. The Bible says we were are no people. He has brought us from different places. Now we are joint heads with Christ. So we want to appreciate him for the great privilege we have. And tonight I want to welcome those who are visiting on this platform for the first time. Brother Rick Davis is here tonight. You are welcome. <laughs> you are welcome. And other people, as they come in, we welcome them. So, Brother Rick, will you like to pray for us, please? Oh, sure. Yeah, this is a great honor to be here. Uh, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Well, Lord, we just come together and uh, acknowledge the, the wonder and majesty of you and your son, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for what you've done for us, for the grace that you've shed abroad in our hearts, for your redemptive work that reaches out to us and draws us to yourself. Father, I ask that tonight that you would just open our hearts to hear and receive your word and to be fed by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you so much. Uh, Uncle, good evening, sir. You are welcome. Good evening, and thank you very much. Yes. How was your week, sir? Ah, very interesting. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we traveled yesterday to Florida. Uh, so I'm speaking okay. from Florida in the United States. So, oh, so. wonderful. Yeah. Nice to have you here again. Still jet lagging. Um, yes. Right. Yes. Just go Thank ahead, you. sir. Thank you very much and uh, welcome everybody. Um it's a real joy and privilege to continue this session. We have been looking at the wonderful book of Revelation, uh, the great book that uh, the Lord allowed to be left for us as a church. Uh, to show what his plans are for the last days. Uh, and you recall that we said that this book was originally addressed to seven churches uh, in present-day Turkey. And um, the Lord wanted to instruct them about what's going to happen at the end of times with particular intention that they should be very careful how they lived so that they will not uh, become part of uh, the group that will be punished at the end of time, but will rather be part of the church that will be taken up into heaven uh, with the glorified Lord to come back to reign with him. Uh, when it comes again, which is really the purpose of, of God in setting up the church to prepare people that will be the bride of Christ. So uh, we've been looking at this book uh, chapter by chapter uh, to see what the Lord has prepared for this uh, particular period. And we said that most Christians today believe that these indeed are the end times, that we are actually living in the end times. And if that be the case, it's therefore very, very important to be aware of what it is uh, that this great and important book, which promises blessings for those who read and apply the teachings of the book, what it promises to us, what it has in store for us. Very important that we, we go through very carefully, understand and begin to live according to the purposes of this book and indeed of the entire scripture. So we we'll turn today to chapter 11, Revelation chapter 11. Um, if uh, who's going to read for us now, let's see. Um, just give me a second to be able to see who is on the line. Uh, I'm not seeing that. Okay, fine. 
So David, please, would you kindly read for us verse 1. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Thank you. Rick, you are welcome. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 1. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angels stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. All right. So this was a, a, an instruction to the author of the book of, of uh, Revelation, which we have already noted to be John, the Apostle John. He was instructed here to take a measuring rod and was told to go and measure the temple of God and the altar and its worshippers. So this was uh, an assignment to measure. And uh, the main point here is that this is not actually the first time we're seeing in scriptures uh, somebody who was assigned to measure uh, measure a place. In Zechariah chapter 2, we are told of uh, the prophet seeing someone in a vision uh, who was going with a measuring line. Somebody is speaking, so please mute when you want to speak. All right. Can we all be sure to mute, please? Thank you. Right. So, Zechariah saw somebody with a measuring line and he was asked to go and measure the city of Jerusalem. In this particular case that we are talking about here, the prophet, I mean, John, was asked to be the one to go and measure. And he was specifically asked to go measure the temple of God and the altar with his worshippers. Now, that, that's very interesting because... Uh, um, as of today, there is no temple in Jerusalem, uh, although at the time John was told to measure the temple here, there was a temple. Uh, but this is the end times, you see. He's talking about what's going to happen at the end of time. So what temple is he talking about? There's no temple in Jerusalem today. In the place of the temple is... Uh, uh, the uh, mosque and uh, the uh, dome of the rock. And so, uh, is, is he talking about that? Or what's he supposed to measure? Uh, so, a lot of people believe that uh, before the end finally comes, a temple is going to be rebuilt where the three first temples had been. You know, there had been three temples earlier on in the city of Jerusalem. The first temple was the one that Solomon built. And then uh, when that was destroyed, uh, Zerubbabel built the second temple. And then Herod, the King Herod, built or expanded, greatly modified, modernized, and enlarged that Zerubbabel Bible, uh, temple. And this third temple was a temple that the Lord Jesus uh, worshipped in. Now, you know, when he was uh, a, a boy of 12, he went to, to teach in the temple. That was a temple. Uh, but before Jesus was crucified, you recall he prophesied that that temple would be destroyed. And in, as a matter of fact, in the year AD 70, it was actually destroyed. And, uh, and, uh, but here we see that there is going to be, apparently, yet another temple. Uh, and as we speak, there are Jews who are very, very, very determined to have a temple set up in, in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. 
where these other temples used to be. And they are very, very, very anxious to, to see. In fact, they, they have a, a whole institute uh, that is dedicated to preparing for a rebuilt temple. Uh, uh, and the events that are going on in, in the Middle East at the moment, particularly in, uh, in, in and around Israel, uh, seem to indicate uh, that there is a great uncertainty uh, at the moment as to what's going to happen. But here we have the Bible clearly talking about a temple that will be existing at the end times. And it had, dimension, it had dimensions that uh, the Lord asked them to go and measure, asked John to go and measure. Uh, and in verse 2, it says, uh, Brad David, please, can you continue the reading? Uh, verse 2 there. But leave out the court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. Hmm. And they will tread the holy city under foot for 42 months. Thank you. So, so the question then comes, what is this outer court? You know, the temple used to have uh, three courts, the outer court, the inner court, uh, and then the holy place, uh, which contained the holy of holies, uh, that the, uh, the high priest had authority to enter into, and that only once a year after he had prepared himself with special purification to enter. So uh, here we, we are told he wasn't to measure the outer court, right? Uh, and he tells us why. He says, because it has been given to the Gentiles. What, what is this? What's all this talking about? Well, one of the suggestions that have been made as, uh, uh, about this, uh, how this temple could possibly be rebuilt uh, on the Temple Mount is that uh, the current Islamic edifices on, on that spot would have to be uh, eliminated. That is to say, uh, broken down and taken over to in order to build the temple. Another suggestion is that actually there's a gap between the uh, dome of the rock, which is that golden dome that you see when you see the picture of the of the of the mount there where the temple used to be. And and the the actual mosque uh that the Muslims are worshiping. They don't worship in the in the dome of the of the rock. It's not a mosque, but the building beside it is a mosque. And then there's a, a gap between them. Some people have suggested that there could be a, a, a resolution of the of the issue between the Muslims and and the uh, and the uh, and uh, and the Jews that could allow the Jews to actually utilize that space in between the two Muslim edifices to build a new temple. Uh, and you can see that it says the because uh, the outer court has been given to the Gentiles. And that's a suggestion that perhaps uh, the area that's occupied by the Dome of the Rock at the moment could indeed be the old uh, uh, outer court. And that if the solution uh, that I've just mentioned was adopted, then uh, it would mean that that could be left for the Muslims, you see. So it says don't measure it because it's it's been given to, to the Gentiles. And it says they would trample on the holy place for 42 months. They would trample on the holy place for 42 months. 
what's that talking about? What's uh, trample on? Uh, trample on means they'll be in charge of, they will uh, utilize for their own purpose, which uh, in comparison to what it was originally meant for, will be actually misusing trample. All right. Uh, and then uh, it says uh, they will trample on it for 42 months. Now, if you calculate 42 months, it's talking about three and a half years. And I've told you earlier about those who believe that the reign of the Antichrist will be seven year period that will be uh, divided into two parts. The first part, which is three and a half months, uh, that will be a period where he will give the impression that he was a man of peace that was sent to sort out the, the big problems of the world. And of course, as you know, one of the biggest, if not the very biggest problem of the world today, uh, politically speaking, is the issue of uh, Jerusalem and uh, the, the, the relationship uh, between the Jews and the and the uh, Palestinians as far as the ownership and rulership of that portion of land is concerned and and the, the, the this this line of thinking suggests that the what the Antichrist is going to do is that he's going to he's going to uh, be a man that pretends to be a man of peace. He's got the solution and the peace effort is going to make will satisfy everybody. And so if that's going to be the case, it's very likely therefore that he will divide that temple mount between the Jews and the Gentiles, between the Jews and the Palestinians or the Arabs and the Muslims. Uh, uh, and, and so that the Jews have their temple, they can worship in their temple, they'll be happy. The Arabs or the um, Muslims can worship in their, on, in their mosque, they'll be happy. Uh, and he will do that for three and a half years. So for that period of three and a half years, the uh, Gentiles will trample on the temple uh, holy place. Uh, there will be a lot, so there will be a side by side uh, worship in a place that was supposed to be reserved only and solely for the worship of God Almighty, uh, and that's why he's uh, the, the the scripture here calls it trampling upon, and and the fact that this three and a half years seems to coincide with the half of seven years that the Antichrist. In, in which period, during which period, the Antichrist will give the impression that he's a man of peace. All right. Um, so that's the first part of, of, of this chapter, talking about uh, this period of time when the Antichrist will be in charge, uh, when he will appear to be a man of peace, when he will seem to be the one who has solutions to intricate worldwide political problems, uh, where he will give the impression that he has a resolution for the age-old uh, Arab or Muslim, Israeli or Jewish problem uh, concerning uh, the Temple Mount and how is uh, who owns it and who who can worship there, who can solve, I mean, who can who can utilize the place uh, and, the, and the solution he's going to give is, uh, you know, let everybody have a share of the place and uh, and there will be peace and everybody will be satisfied and contented for this period of forty two months. But verse 3 introduces uh, a new uh, insight into what else might be taking place at about the same time. Verse 3, um, yes. Pastor David, can you continue the reading if you don't mind? Thank you. And I will give power to my two witnesses. 
and they will prophesy 1,260 days, cloth in sackcloth. All right. I will appoint my two witnesses. I will appoint, now this is God speaking now. I will appoint my two witnesses. What does that mean? Some people think um, this is going to be literal. Two people will be prophesying for God in Jerusalem uh, at, at this time. Um, uh, other people think uh, it's only figurative. Uh, it's talking about uh, the church and Israel and the Jews, uh, two prophets, uh, two witnesses. But as we read the, the passage on, it, it appears rather clear that it's not talking about, um, it's not talking about um, uh, anything that is uh, figurative, seems to be talking about two specific people who are going to be prophets speaking for God uh, at this time, and I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy, uh, uh, and it, it gives the length of time that they will prophesy, 1,260 days, and uh, if you divide that number of days with uh, the number of days in the year, you will end up again with three and a half years. Three and a half years. So the 42 months mentioned in verse 2 and the 1,260 days mentioned in verse 3 uh, appear actually to be talking about the same space of time. So at the time when the Antichrist will appear to be a very good man, a very peaceful man, peace-loving man, a very powerful world leader, able to solve the world's problems, there will be these two people in Jerusalem, appointed and empowered by God Almighty, who will begin to speak out for God. Right? They will be witnessing for God. For one thing, as we saw earlier, the church has been taken up and the rapture has taken place. And uh, the Jews, on the other hand, seem to be contented with what the Antichrist or the world ruler who or has emerged as the ruler of the world. We'll be seeing a little more about him in a later chapter. Um, They'll be rejoicing. They'll be, you know, they're happy because he has resolved their problem, their intractable problem. You know, a problem they couldn't solve by warfare, a problem they couldn't solve by diplomacy, a problem they couldn't solve by politics. And this man has come and solved it. He has resolved the issues. And so there's peace. But these two people are going to be, to, to be speaking out for God, which means he will be against the world ruler, against the world uh, trends at the time, against what the, everybody in the world is agreeing with. These two people will be speaking against that. And they will be speaking for the entire length of time that... Uh, 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 the Antichrist will be um, perceived as a man of peace. All right. All right. And so let's read verse 4 again, Pastor. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before, uh, before the God of the earth. All right. Thank you. Olive trees, lampstands. Where have we seen that before in the Bible? Zechariah chapter 4. Uh, Dolly, can you read for us? Zechariah chapter 4, verse 3, verse 11, 
and verse 14. All right, yes, sir. Um, good evening, sir. Zachariah yeah. chapter 4. Chapter 11, verse chapter 4. Oh, chapter 11. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 3, 11, and 14. Okay. Zechariah chapter 4, verse Three reads as follows. I'm reading from the New King James. So two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bow and the other at its left. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? And then this? this 11. 11. Um, then I answered and said to him, What are these two olive trees at the right of the lampstand and at its left? And verse 14. 14. So he said, These are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. Okay. So here in Zechariah, we see the same imagery that was used to describe the uh, the uh, two witnesses that the Lord talks about in uh, Revelation chapter um, 11. In other words, these two people are specially sent by God. They are... Uh, some people feel they are not just ordinary humans. Uh, others feel that they represent some specific prophets who had who had prophesied in Israel and had gone. We're not told this. Uh, these are just speculations. But what is clear is that these are special people sent by God with a special responsibility at a very delicate time in the history of Israel, at a time when Israel is being misled into thinking that they have peace. Uh, uh, what Jesus talked about in Matthew 24, when they say peace, peace, then sudden destruction will come upon them. You know, At a time when uh, they think that finally their their national problem has been solved uh, instead of uh, being a pariah, pariah state like the whole world is beginning to appear to see Israel as uh, 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 God has finally answered their their problem and sent this person uh, to be uh, their their deliverer uh, and to give them peace. Uh, at that same time, God then raises these two people who are going to be speaking the truth for God, you know, uh, where nobody listens uh, uh, to the truth anymore, uh, where everybody thinks the problem has been solved. They are talking about God. They are talking about repentance. They are talking about re returning to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, talking about Jesus as the Savior. Uh, and, and uh, as as a Messiah, as the one God had already sent uh, to solve the problem of the world, and so on. And so you can imagine that there will be great opposition to them. If there's going to be uh, peace in the land, if if uh, everybody is going to assume that th their national problem has finally been solved, uh, and then these people who begin to prophesy against the Antichrist, against this peace that appears to have come, they will be seen as upstarts. They will be seen as, you know, people who are against peace. Um, and so we go to verse 5 of uh, Revelation 11. Uh, back to you, Pastor. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. Mm. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. 
Hmm. Wow. So these are special kind of prophets. Uh, sometimes uh, when when you are preaching uh, and there is opposition to what you are saying, you you would wish you had this kind of power uh, to send fire uh, to to devour the, the the people that that oppose you, um, much like uh, Paul had power when he was uh, preaching. Uh, like in Acts, Acts 13, verse 11, Acts 13, uh, verse 11. Sister Moya, would you like to read for us Acts 13, verse 11? Unmute so we can. You are muted still. You are muted, so we are not hearing you. A mute. It, yeah, yeah, you have not unmuted. Rick, would you please like to read for us? Sure. Acts 13, verse 7? Uh, 13, verse 7? 11, please. 11, excuse me. Okay. And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Yes, thank you. So th this this was a situation where Paul was preaching in in Cyprus, and uh, uh, and the the uh, the governor, the Roman governor of the place, seemed to be interested. In, in the word of God and had invited Paul and his team to come and speak to him. And uh, there, there was this, uh, uh, this uh, bad Jesus who had been opposing Paul uh, in this situation. And uh, uh, he had spiritual influence over the governor and over the people. And he stood in opposition to Paul. Uh, so Paul, Paul spoke to him and, and cursed him and asked him to be blinded for a time. Uh, and the man actually lost his sight on the spot. Just like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm using that to show us that sometimes um, spiritual people who have power are given authority by God to use that power not just for good, but sometimes for harm. Uh, so these two prophets we are seeing in um, in uh, in the book of Revelations are not the first. They're not going to be the first ones uh, to to harm those who oppose them uh, for the sake of the gospel. Paul had done that in Acts uh, of the Apostles, as, as we have just seen. All right. So here. Uh, they, they, but these people's power was quite ferocious. Uh, they could cause fire to come from their own mouths and and act, literally burn up their enemies um, and uh, and and to burn them to death. You know, um, so this was the way that God enabled them to preach in the context in which they were because you see that the, there was peace in the land the people were happy with the situation and these people were speaking against uh uh what was happening what was popular they were going against the grain uh, uh, uh and so yet god wanted them to preach throughout that entire period when there was this peaceful reign of the Antichrist in the land. Uh, and so God had to give them uh, an enablement to, 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 to strengthen them so that they could survive in that period. Otherwise, they would never have been allowed to preach. Verse 6. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn to blood and to strike the earth 
with all plagues as often as they desire. So these are really, really powerful, powerful preachers. They were preaching, uh, preaching things that the people didn't want to hear. Uh, and I imagine that the religious leaders of the time would be against them because obviously the problems have been solved. All right? The Antichrist has come. He, he is a messiah. Uh, and now you're opposing him. Uh, and so they, uh, they needed this power from God not only to strike individuals to death who oppose them directly, but to cause uh, there to be no rain, like in the days of Elijah, and to cause plagues uh, to, to, to uh, plague the land and the people uh, on earth with every kind of plague as often as they wanted. All right. So uh, this is the reason why some people thought or teach that uh, these two prophets are Elijah and Moses, because uh, Moses had, um, had uh, um, Elijah had shot the heavens from the rain, and Elijah and uh, Moses had used plagues. Uh, but remember, uh, both the shutting of the heavens from the rain and the uh, plague, uh, different kinds of plagues and turning water to blood was not done by the power of either of those two prophets. It was done by the power of God. And so God could give the same power to anybody else to do the same. So that, that does not necessarily prove that it would be Elijah and Moses, is what I'm trying to say. But the fact that it was the same God, the God of Elijah and the God of Moses, that uh, was to send these uh, special uh, men of God to prophesy at this time. Right, verse 7. When they finished their testimony, the beasts that are sent out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. All right. So here, yeah, finally, we hear of the Antichrist directly now. Uh, the beast, the beast, that's what the Bible calls him, the beast. Uh, uh, and it tells us where he comes from, from the abyss. He comes up from the abyss. And we saw earlier how when uh, a, a star fell from heaven, uh, and, and hit the earth. It was given the keys of the abyss, and that enabled, you remember those locusts that came, uh, and then their leader, uh, uh, who was called Apophis, uh, was, uh, was their oh, leader. Yeah. All right. And here, he said to have um, uh, the same one that came out of the pit, uh, the beast that comes up from the abyss, will attack them, overpower them, and kill them. Now, these are the two that have been described as the two olive branches that come and, you know, uh, that uh, stand before the Lord. These are special prophets that have been sent directly by God for this period of time. These are prophets who had hitherto had power to uh, overcome their enemies and kill them, and even to afflict punishment on, on the earth. How come they were so finally killed? In fact, the question would be, how come this um, beast how come he decided to attack them at the end of the three and a half years? All right. Um, well, it, it just means that the period, that first period of out of the seven year period had ended and that phase of God's plan had ended. So he allowed uh, these men to be overpowered or captured Uh to, to be attacked, to be overpowered, and then to be killed. God allowed it to happen. God does allow difficult times to come upon 
his servant sometimes. Uh, he even allows uh, some of his prophets to be harmed, to be attacked, even to be killed. The fact that a prophet or a, a preacher or a man of God is arrested or is killed does not mean that God has abandoned him. It doesn't mean that, you know, he he has lost favor with God or he has done something that God did not want him to do. No, God has phases for what he wants to do and what he wants to allow. And he has methods of achieving different things that he has proposed for different times. So this time, uh, there was this time, three and a half years, he allowed them to preach and nobody was allowed to harm them, not even the Antichrist, you know, for that entire period. But when the time came, God allowed them to be arrested, all within God's purpose, to be killed uh, even, all right? Uh, and uh, he, verse 8 um, even describes a, a worse scenario. Can you read verse 8 to us? And their bo dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city, mm. which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, mm -hmm. where also our Lord was crucified. All right. So mm. this is what let us know, apart from the temple uh, that uh, uh, John was asked to measure, this is what let us know that we're talking about Jerusalem clearly. All right. Their bodies will lie in the public square of, of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Why is Jerusalem called Sodom? Why is Jerusalem called Egypt? All right. He says figuratively called Sodom. Uh, Sodom is a city that we associate with sinful practices, particularly homosexuality. Uh, and uh, it appears that uh, uh, homosexuality will be very rife uh, at, at this period uh, and, and also even in Jerusalem. And that's happening even as we speak. Um, the gay rights people are very much active in Jerusalem as we speak. Uh, the 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 uh, what do they call it? Uh, the Gay Pride Day uh, and all of that is celebrated in Jerusalem uh, even now. So if if you decide to call it Sodom, you won't be wrong even today. Not to talk of when the Antichrist will come with his reign, and that that shows us something else about the reign of the Antichrist is that he will permit sin. All right. Uh, and then Egypt, why is it called Egypt? False religion, false worship. Um, we today associate Egypt with Islam, all right? And uh, uh, Jerusalem is acclaimed to be a city, city of Islam, even today, uh, because of that mosque. And that's again what gives us the impression that that mosque could be allowed to remain there uh, as a as a part of this of of the solution uh, to this uh, intricate problem that had bedeviled the entire political system of the world, even till now. All right, verse nine, sir. Then those from the peoples, tribes tongues and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into the graves. Let's we'll continue all to, to verse 10. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them. Make merry and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Hmm. So, so these two prophets who had been going against the grain, 
who have been teaching against what appeared to be a peaceful resolution of a problem that had been there for long, uh, and at the same time had been given powers to torment those who opposed them, even to kill the people who resisted them and to afflict the earth. These two had now died and were put into uh, on display, as it were. You know, left there, their bodies left there in Jerusalem, and apparently by television, uh, people of the earth, you see what it says there in verse 9, every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies. All right. Uh, I recall that uh, in the in the late 70s and 80s when we began to uh, seek an understanding of some of these scriptures uh, we had wondered how the peoples of the whole earth will be able to be gazing at the bodies that were lying in Jerusalem how was that going to be possible yeah but clearly obviously this day uh, it's obvious that uh, now that television is so popular uh, and worldwide and uh, 24-hour news networks exist everywhere, that will be the means through which every nation, every language, people of every every tribe uh, will be able to gaze at these bodies wherever you are, uh, in South Africa, in Nigeria, in uh, Europe, in America, you'll be able to see these bodies uh, and, and as they say, they will, they will gloat over them. They will gloat over them. All right. Um, and, and then they, they will, you know, they will rejoice. They will celebrate. They will send gifts to each other, you know, to mark this great event. It's like, you know, it's like uh, independence has finally come. You know, these upstarts have, have finally been gotten rid of, rid of. Our problem is finally solved. You know, nobody will be uh, striking the earth with these miraculous powers anymore. Uh, and, you know, they're dead. They're dead. And they celebrate it and uh, uh, talk about it all over the world. But something wonderful happens mm -hmm. in verses 11 and uh, verses uh, 11 and 12. Can you read those? Now, after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. Mm. Wow. So, uh, after the three and a half days, the breath of the Lord from God entered them. Okay? We know that uh, dead bodies are, are dead bodies. Um, they are finished. Their spirits are gone, you know. But, um, but when the spirit of the Lord enters a person who is dead, uh, then that person comes alive. As a matter of fact, when God created Adam, and Adam, he, he made him out of clay. Uh, and it was when he breathed into that statue, the breath of God, uh, that it became a living soul. So similarly, these people were created again, as it were, by God. He breathed his breath into them, uh, and they stood to their feet. It's like the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, and, and, and terror struck those people who saw this. All right. Uh, obviously, this kind of place would have become uh, a, a tourist attraction. Many people would have been going to Israel to just see this, uh, these terrible people that have finally been put to death. Uh, it wasn't just enough to see it on television. They had to travel there to see it. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, uh, and, but then when the, uh, the fourth day, on the fourth day, they were raised by the power of God, terror struck those who saw it. 
they were terrified. How would you react when you see corpses uh, that have been televised all over the world? They stood up on their feet. People were frightened. And then they heard a voice from heaven, a loud voice from heaven saying to them. So this was spoken specifically to these two, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. Okay, so again, televised around the world. They, they were taken up to heaven. Okay, um, verse 13, sir. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake, hmm. and the tent of the city fell. Hmm. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed. Hmm. The rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. Hmm. Wow. At that very hour, the voice of God was heard, and these people were taken up to heaven in a cloud, like Jesus was taken up in the ascension. Uh, at that very hour, there was a severe earthquake, and a tent of the city collapsed. What city? Jerusalem, obviously. A tent of Jerusalem collapsed. And 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. Most earthquakes don't kill that many people at, at the same time, uh, particularly in well-built cities like Jerusalem is. But this was so great, so severe, that 7,000 people were killed at the same time. And the result was that the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Hmm. And now this is instructive because, you see, uh, uh, at this time, the Antichrist had been reigning for three and a half years. Uh, and, and one of the major points he was coming up to was that he was just about to publicly finally declare himself to be God. Uh, and obviously, even in that initial three and a half years, because of the peace that he had brought to the earth, people had been seeing him as God. They would say, oh, this God has finally come. The Messiah has finally come. You know, the solution has finally come. Even the Jews were going to, were sucked into this and were praising this man. And so when this destruction suddenly happens, they were terrified. And they began to give glory to the one that it had been due all along to the God of heaven. They began to glorify the God of heaven. And it says in verse 14, sir. The second war is past. Behold, the third war is coming quickly. Hmm. You recall those three angels uh, that were... Uh, we are told to bring war to the earth. It says they're going to bring three wars to the earth. And, uh, and uh, this is the second war that we saw, uh, this event concerning the, um, the prophets from God and what happened to them. Uh, and it says the second war has passed. The third war is coming soon. All right. I think we better stop here for today and uh, so that we can take a few questions and uh, we'll see what happens uh, thereafter in, in the middle of the chapter. Okay, so by, back to you, Sister Abigail. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, it's open now for discussion, for questions. Just signify. Okay. Uh, okay. Love, please go ahead. 
I didn't see anybody there called love. <laughs> ah, I'm good. <laughs> <It's a> mistake. <laughs> Okay, go it's ahead. a hidden name. Oh, <laughs> it needs revelation. <laughs> okay, go ahead, brother. Thank you for the, the exposition on this chapter. It's so clear. What is the whole idea of measuring the temple? I, I think I think that is symbolic. Um Brother David, I think really what God was trying to prove was that the fact that there is a temple built in Jerusalem does not mean that it's satisfactory. You know, when when you are asked to measure something, you are measuring it against the standard. You recall that when uh, Moses was asked to build or to set up uh, the uh, the tent. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, with the Ark of uh, Tabernacle and all of that, uh, he was given specifications. And he was told to build according to specifications. Uh, uh, and then they were given commandments. They were told how to worship in the place, very specifically. Uh, and, and clearly, the fact that these people uh, although there's a temple standing there, they are now uh, giving all the praise to the Antichrist. They were now calling somebody who is not God, the Messiah, uh, 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 and so on, shows that the, the thing is defective. They, 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 they are not practicing Judaism as it was supposed to be practiced. They were not worshipping God satisfactorily. And the way you prove that is to to judge it. You, one way of judging is to measure. So the whole point of measuring is to um, indicate the fact that God was not satisfied with just the rebuilding of the temple, just the fact that there was a, a, a system set up and they were worshipping. These people were still practicing uh, something that caused them to be called Sodom. You know, uh, and to be going side by side with something that made them be called Egypt. God could not be satisfied with that. So the measurement is to judge it. It's like weighing it to see uh, whether it's up to standard. Yeah. Okay. So so it means the worship was not really acceptable worship. Oh, absolutely not. It could not have been because of the role of the Antichrist in the whole thing. And the uh, uh, and the fact that um, uh, the, 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 the righteousness did not come out of it was okay. of his not being accepted. Yeah, because after the sacrifice of Christ, we got turn around and still accept animal sacrifice and all that in the temple. That's, that's another way of saying it. Yes, thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Is there any other person? Wow. Thank you so much, Uncle. I think uh, I don't see anybody's hand raised. But I think it's very clear. You know, it was a nice teaching tonight. Love, did you raise your hand again? Yeah. Oh. It's uh, the on who made in Zechariah chapter 4. Yeah. Okay. I think the two olive trees there, was it not particularly with reference to Joshua and uh, Zerubbabel himself? It was to with reference with, if you see that they were yielding olive oil that was, you know, used in the worship of God. Uh, it was with reference to some people believe to the spirit of God, uh, the fact that you know the spirit of God was uh, in these people, that was the main point. They were because in that time, there was script uh, prophesying yeah. to encourage Zerubbabel and Joshua. So probably these were the two. Well, yes, two. That, the, the the relationship is that there were two witnesses at that time. There are two witnesses at this time. I don't think they have to be the same people at all. Okay. 
and the two witnesses here. Some people say say it could be Enoch and um, Elijah, since they didn't die. Well, uh, that that's that's uh, that's a, a long shot. And, and, and there's no proof of that. People just try to rationalize unnecessarily. I don't think it's even necessary to worry about the specificity of who these people are. Okay. Thanks. Yes, Bro Joseph, you're welcome. I see your hand raised. Joseph Gowoka. Uh, greetings all. Uh, uh, my question is just one that through worship, which we see like in Jerusalem, like mostly I'm uh, gonna see those people uh, kissing the Western Gate and uh, the war, Western War. So can we also include that, like it's a true worship, or that is acceptable? Uh, is Okay. okay, thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, people visit uh, the uh, so-called Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, uh, uh, and it's become a national symbol for Israel, and uh, people like to go there, or even Christians go there, uh, some world leaders go there, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, oh, obviously, even they realize that that's not that's not what the that's not equivalent to temple worship. It, it does not equate to how God had been worshipped in Israel even before now. Um, uh, but that's another thing altogether. That's even they realize that it's not satisfactory. It does it, it doesn't replace the temple. It does uh, going to pray there does not replace the. Uh, uh, Jesus said, for instance, in Matthew twenty four, that the entirety of the temple will be destroyed. No one stone will be left on the other, uh, uh, and so th those stones there are probably uh, either uh, subterranean uh, foundation for the for that was the temple before. Or some people even say uh, that wasn't even the temple. That was just a Roman fortress that was there. And so on. But it doesn't matter. What concerns us today is that the true Messiah, the Lord Jesus, has come. He was rejected by the bulk of the Jews, even today. Uh, 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 and so even substituting him with another temple on, on the mount uh, and so on, uh, especially under the leadership of the Antichrist, can never be a substitute for the true worship of the Almighty God. All right. Thank you. So, but there are a lot of Christians today that are crazy about pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And uh, even when they are baptized, they want to go back and get baptized again in River Jordan, and uh, prayer shows are used everywhere to symbolize uh, association with Israel and Christianity. Uh, people going to the grave of Jesus and all that. What do we say about this mixture? A, a lot of this is just religion. Christianity is not religion. Christianity is a relationship between us and God. God has made peace with us through the crucifixion and death of Jesus Christ. Uh, I recall somebody offered me a place to go to go to Jerusalem and all that pilgrimage stuff many years ago. Uh, and uh, the Nigeria government was going to pay for for that trip. And I I just, I just felt I had more important things to do. 
than to go uh, and look at things. The object of my faith is not those things. It's not physical. Uh, my, my relationship is with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus talked about the fact that uh, blessed are those who do not see but believe. Uh, and I, I, I'd rather be one of those. Uh, you see, the whole thing is, the, the way the Antichrist would mislead the people will be through religion. He will set up a religion and that's what we're seeing here. It sets up a temple, a building. Uh, it solves a political problem. Uh, there is great symbolism. The acts of uh, killing animals and sacrifices resume. And, you know, everything appears to be going very, very well. But thank God for these two witnesses who will not accept mere religion. The God they're talking about that they wanted to worship was the one that spoke from heaven. He was the one that breathed into these two men from heaven. He was the one even beforehand that empowered them to do the great miracles, signs and wonders that they were doing uh, at the time. So uh, religion, Christianity is not a religion. All this symbolism, all these... Uh, uh, you know, uh, we have this building here. We we use this incense here. We use this uh, holy water there, um, and uh, we wear this uh, chasuble now. We wear the other. All those are not it. There's no place in the Bible where they can show me all this. You know, the relationship that the Bible talks about is with God, and is by faith. And faith requires does not require you to see. Uh, the tomb where Jesus was buried. All right. Thank you. In fact, even the, the 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 women who went to that tomb were told, "Why do you seek the living amongst the exactly. dead?" Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, sir, and thank That's you, Lord, for those relevant questions. Really. And Uncle, we want to appreciate you again and Auntie Moyo for, you know, spending time to teach and to build us up, to prepare us for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ so that we might be without spot nor wrinkled. And I want to say that we are really learning and we are taking in all that you are teaching us. And we are trusting the Lord to give you more grace as you teach and comes out so simple and clear that God will give you more utterance as well. Thank you so much, sir. And Auntie, good evening, Ma. <laughs> we would like you to pray for us after this last song. I hope Auntie is still around. Yes, I am around. <laughs> okay, good evening. Ma. Good evening, <laughs> good evening okay, after everybody. The... Yes, you will pray for us Ma, after the last song. Okay. Thank you so much. Yep. Let us pray. Father, we thank you very much. Thank you, Lord, for this word you have expanded to us. These are indeed the last days. And you're opening our eyes to these things so that we will beware. So that we will prepare. So that we shall not miss going with you, Jesus. So that, Lord, we will not be found wanting at the end. Father, we are grateful. We are very grateful. Lord, I pray for all of us. I pray for us. Help us with your grace. Help us with your power. It is not by might. It is not by power. It is by the Spirit of God. Oh, Lord God of heaven, help us that we shall not be found wanting in what you require of us in these last days. Thank you, Lord. I pray for all of us that have had these teachings. Go with us with your power, go with us with your Holy Spirit to remind us again and again of these things. And help us, Lord, not to keep this knowledge to ourselves alone. Help us to share it with brethren. 
with our neighbors, with Christians that we know, so that we shall all be better prepared for you. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us. Thank you, Lord. And keep us till next week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Auntie. And as we go this week, I pray that the Lord will help us to keep this hope that we have in Christ so that we can keep ourselves purified, so that we can meet him clean, unblemished. Have a pleasant week. Looking forward to seeing you again next weekend. Thank you so much. God bless you and bye.